So last week, I'll, I'll read a couple of scriptures from last week too, but I'll just go over it a little bit. Uh, suddenly there came sound from heaven as a mighty rushing, a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. This is in Acts 2, 1 to 4. That's, that's 1 to 2, that part. Yeah. And, um, and, then, uh, and then, but Christ is the son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So we are Jesus' house, the, the Holy Ghost come into the house and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, so the breath of life, God's breath, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit breathed into man again. But everyone hears these sayings of mine and does not, whoever hears these, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So we're destined to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There was places there where Jesus, well that's the scripture I'm going to read, but where, where God made it for man to have the Holy Spirit, where to receive the Holy Spirit, we're destined it's an inside of us. He breathed into Adam and that spirit became a living being. It, it's what keeps us alive. It's a living being inside of us. It needs to be revived, but we need to somewhere along the line be filled with the Holy Spirit or something to wake that one up inside of us so we can continue to what, <laughs> be convicted of our sin. That was another one from last week was be convicted of our sin because if we get convicted of our sin, the spirit was sent into the world to convict us, John 16, 8 and 9, to convict the world of its sin, of sin because they do not believe in me. So we need the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins so we can believe in Jesus in the first place. But that the Spirit has filled the house. That was the main one. And we are the house. The Holy Spirit fills us. It was placed in us when God breathed in the nostrils of Adam when he was a clump of, a lump of clay. The spirit was put there, but somewhere in our life we need to awaken it. We live in a, a, a way better day today because we have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Back in the Old Testament days, they just had it come upon them, they'd prophesy or whatever, and then it'd be taken away from them. But we have it given without measure, poured out continually into us, and into us continually over and over and over. We can have it, a great infilling of the Holy Spirit that awakens the spirit that was in there that God had placed in there when he first breathed into us to convict us of our sins, to show us that we're sinners because we live life, I know I did, I lived life without even recognising that I had any sin, I just lived it and then all of a sudden it gets awoken in you that you become a sinner and that Holy Spirit is convicting you so you can begin to change and God begins to do a work in our life. So John... 20, verse 21. This is the one I love, this part. Mm. Look at that. Jesus. Mm. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father had sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So Father, I just pray for the revelation of your word, Almighty God. We need revelation, Father. Without revelation, Lord, it's just the word, Father. But with revelation, Lord, it becomes alive and living to us, Father. And we need a word that's alive and living, Father. We don't need just black letters on a, on a piece, white piece of paper, Father. We need a word that's alive and living inside of us, Almighty God. So we pray for revelation. We thank you for revelation, Father. We praise you and honour you, Almighty God. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So there it is. The Holy Spirit breathing on their face. Breathing on He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So it was destined that we receive the Holy Spirit. We were, we're meant to have the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of there's a lot of people, I'm telling you, there's a lot of churches out there that reject the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I know that God showed me when I was digging into the word a month or so ago, that God showed me he could accept him being rejected. He could accept Jesus being reject, rejected. 
but it's the final straw. There's no other way to salvation. When Jesus comes the next time, it's going to take a bride that's ready to be taken back to him. And that bride can only be ready if it receives conviction of its sin and turns away from its sin. And the only way that they can do that is by the Holy Spirit. God, I believe God said, if this is the final straw. If you reject the Holy Spirit this time, there's no other way, no other way to salvation. Now, you can't reject the Holy Spirit because he's the one that's going to He's going to show us our conviction, our sin, and, and let us realise that we, we're going against God. We're doing, we're doing stuff against God. Even the prodigal son, when he came back, he didn't say he sinned against his neighbour. I sinned against my father, and I sinned against heaven. So we've got that's who we've got to know. <laughs> that's where the repentance comes from. When we know we're doing it against our father, and we're doing it against heaven. Amen? So I'm just brushing through these ones. Matthew 8, 27. These are just going on a bit from last week. Not going on, but you know. Not going on, going on, but you know. <laughs> following on from last week. <laughs> so then men marvelled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? So last week I was saying, when that happened, the Holy Spirit was in the house. We are the house. We get filled with the Holy Spirit. Even the winds and the wave obey him. What did we see in Acts? The wind was a mighty gushing wind, <coughs> a picture of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Even the wind obeyed him. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father in intercession for us. Even the wind, even the Holy Spirit obeys him. When he says, Holy Spirit inside of Matthew, there's this stuff going on. I want you to convict him of that. Then it's the Holy Spirit obeying Jesus because even the, whole, the wind obeys him. And he shows me, and, and there might be stuff around me life that he does, he shows me, I get convicted of that, and not because I feel sorry for myself, but because I feel sorry for my Father in heaven, and, and who is in heaven, I've sinned against them, I repent and I turn away. I walk away from that, and then Jesus, then Jesus lets me go along in life some other way, and then he comes along and he says, Holy Spirit... I'm controlling you again. He's praying in intercession to the Father. Can you change this in me? The Holy Spirit will come along and he'll allow stuff to happen in me life. For that to come up again, for me, to, and, and I can just keep walking in it. Or I can be like the racehorse that goes round and round the racetrack. I can just keep going round and round and round. I can receive it. I can have feel sorry. I can have guilt and sorry. But if I don't repent and I don't have the conviction of it, I'll just keep going around the racetrack and going around the racetrack. And going around the racetrack and going around the racetrack until finally one day, because it's God's deepest desire that I would be saved, that I could be saved. So it'll be God's deepest, it's his deepest desire that one day I'll get the message. And how much heartache and how much hurt and how much pain I want to bring on myself is totally up to me. But God will one day, he will bring me to the place of repentance because my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he's going to get me to there because he's not going to give up. The only one that's going to stop me from going, I was there driving along with my boss. She was only a supervisor. One day going to Dolby State School, we doing a bit of work in there. And she's, and she's preaching to me all the way out, making it she's been spiro. And I'm just listening to her. <laughs> she said that when we pulled up at the Dolby State School, she actually said, she said, no, I don't believe that if, if God's love, that a God of love would never send anyone to hell. And I looked at her and I said, you're exactly right. That's right. God will never send anyone to hell. It's our own evil, lustful desires. We are the ones that place ourselves in the predicament of going to hell. She didn't talk to me for two months. That's me, boss. She didn't talk to me for two months. Just for the, I had the drive back home with her. <laughs> two months, didn't talk to me. But that's the power of God, mate. mate it, when that's conviction, guilt or something come upon her, it wasn't that she was angry with me. She actually realised that, <laughs> I'm the one taking myself to hell, not God. <laughs> praise the Lord, praise God. He's a great God. So he's not going to send anyone to hell. Our own lustful desires, our own evil desires inside of us, they're the ones that are going to get us there. So 2 Corinthians 3. This is where... 
God was speaking to me. Verse 7. But if the ministry of death, written engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? And I thought about that, I thought about that, I thought about that. If the ministry of death was glorious, so what they're saying, the, 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 what we're talking about the law here. Yeah. Moses set the law up. When we're talking about Moses, we're talking about the law. So what they're saying, the glory of the law was death. It was glorious. The people thought, yeah, yeah. Same with my life. When I was living in sin and living, I thought it was a glorious life and everything was glory about and everything was great going on and that. Well, that's the law too. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow on because I'm not going to leave it at that. I couldn't, leave, I couldn't sit with that. I couldn't sit with that, that we're talking about the law actually being glorious in death. It wouldn't sit with me. So what is this saying? That the law is death and death was glorious? Well, I believe this, you do not even have to look outside the church to see people glorifying in their unrighteousness. It's true. There's people in the church. We don't even have to go outside the walls. Just in here, right? In here, in this little church, in this little gathering we've got here, there's stuff going on. We don't have to look outside where people glory in their unrighteousness. People are glorying in their unrighteousness, but I'm not going to give up on it. So what is this saying? That the law is death and death was glorious? Well, I believe, I'm reading this because this didn't sit right with me and I don't want to say nothing wrong here. So what, what, what is this saying? That the law is death and death was glorious? Well, I believe, oh, did I just read say that? Yeah. The glory on Moses' face that shine was passing away says to me that the glory of death written on stones was passing away also. So I've quoted this a hundred times. The reason why Moses put the Baal, I've just read it. How will the, oh, hang on, which the glory was passing away. Moses had this glory on his face, but because he was a natural man like us, mm -hmm. because he was a sinful man like us, we get this glory on us, and God, uh, look, we should have a glory cloud on us. We should look like light. We shouldn't look like death. We get this glory on us, and then we live for God. You see people come into the church, and they live for God on fire. Four months, six months, they become alive. I've been, pr I've prayed for people. I've prayed for people, mate. Louie's been there with me. I've prayed for people, and it instantly, they've gone. This dead draw on their face has just gone, and they just begin to look alive. That that one that used to come on the Wednesday night. Uh, I forget her name. She was like that. She was just looking old and dead and then just instant on a prayer. She became alive. It just became alive. And people do that. They, they live for God for four months and you look at them, they're alive. And then they go back to their old life. And you can just see. You can see the glory of God fading, getting deader and deader. And then all of a, all of a sudden, it's back looking this old, wrinkled, dragged out, death look on their face again. That's, I'm just saying that the glory's gone and the, 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 you can see death on their face again. Well, this is what was happening to Moses because this is what I believe, and I just read it here, which the glory was passing away, the glory was fading because he was, we have the power of the Holy Spirit in field without measure. And how many days can you go without sinning? How many days can you go without sinning? Hey? Well, this was the same thing with Moses. He didn't have the Spirit of God the way we have it, so he was the same thing. He was dabbling here and dabbling there the same way. We don't go out drinking and partying and whatever, gambling and whatever like that. We just might think the wrong things and we might say the wrong things. We might do the wrong actions. Our, at the moment, I hope they're not anyway. Our sins aren't big. They're, they're big to us because we want to be pure and spotless before Jesus. But they're not big to someone outside. Oh, well, hang up, there's even someone out there is giving the, oh, it's just adultery. What are you going on about? <laughs> adultery, I'm glad it's not me. You know, adulterers can't go to heaven. I'm glad it's not me caught up in it. Anyway, can you see what I'm saying? 
it fades. The glory fades. And that's why Moses at first, he shone, but he covered his face. I would have walked around, look at me, mate, I've been that close to God. But he covered his face to the people not to be able to see the glory fade. But I was not at that time, so I might not have seen it then, but now. I was going to read it before. The glory on Moses' face that shine was passing away. It says to me that the glory of death written on stones was passing away. That's right, but I wasn't back then. I wasn't alive back then, so I can't really say that I would know because now I'm reading the word with an infilling of the Holy Spirit and I've got insight into the word of God and I can see it now that Moses' face was losing the shine because the Ten Commandments was going to lose its shine over time because Jesus was going to step in because we couldn't obey it and he was going to become our righteousness and we were going to get inside of him so that we could be the righteousness of God inside of Jesus. That's what that little bit was all about. So Romans 7. I'm still, I'm still not convinced. I'm not convinced. 7 verse 13. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. And I went, yeah, that's why. Because without the law, people didn't know they were sin. I didn't, well, I weren't alive back then, I just said that. But without the law in my life, here, without Christ, I didn't know I was a sinner. I just was living life and thought this is how life is. You can lie, you can cheat, you can steal, you can do whatever you want to do. There's no sin, that's not sin. That's just trying to get through life. But then when the law came into my life, I realised that I was a sinner. So when the law was given back up until Moses, before the law, the people didn't know that they were sinners. And sin was sin. But the law, I just read, the law was given so people could see that they were exceedingly sinful. That they were very sinful. That's why the law, the glory of death was given, the, the glory of death was given to us so that we could see that we were sinful people, that we had a sinful nature and that we needed to repent and get that cleaned up in our life, get stuff worked out in our life and move on into a new person and a new creation. So the idea of the commandment was to make sin become exceedingly sinful because it wasn't. It wasn't. Sin didn't exist. But when the law was put in place, when I broke the law, I realised now, oh, God calls breaking the law sin. So then I realised that this law's been put there, this is my salvation for me, this law's been placed in front of me, and I looked and thought, wow, mate, I am exceedingly sinful. Mate, I've got a shocking life, I live terrible. God, how are you going to change me from this? And I never ever thought God could do it, but he done it. He done it. And he's doing it. It's still a process that's taken place today. But he done it. I used to think, God, how am I ever going to stop being like this? I don't know how I'm going to be stopping. How am I going to stop it? I'm just it's stuck with me, God. And that's how I used to live. How am I ever going to get away from this, God? Oh, anger. Anger. That, that's the main thing, mate. If you've seen me get angry now, you've just seen a touch. A glitz of what I used to be. I was like a cyclone that would hit a place for 20 minutes, destroy it, and then wake out, snap me out of it and realize, what's going on? What's happened? <laughs> that's how I used to be. Honestly, that's how I used to be. So what see me get angry today is only a snippet, only a, a reflection of what I used to be. And that's what I was stuck in and I was thinking, God, I'm never going to be able to get out of this. How am I ever going to be able to get away from this? I'm stuck like this forever. Because I'd be going along good and bang, something had happened. And I could have just went, oh, and just moved on. Sorry, God. Or I could have got there in full repentance. Man, oh, sorry, God. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to, if you've taken the drugs, God, you've taken the alcohol, you've taken, why can't you take this, God? 
I asked and questioned him over and over and over and I questioned him and questioned him and questioned him and bang, bang, it happens. As long as you keep repenting with a true heart, with trueness in your heart, repent and walk away from it and go and stay away from the things that used to stir you up and get you mad and whatever, whatever, whatever. Stay away. That's why I give up boxing. I went boxing for years and one night I stepped into this little fella's punch. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't. One night this fella come to boxing. He, he come there because we used to have, I used to have about 10 rounds of sparring every night. This fella, would, this fella come there and, and he was there and he was the big, he, was, he thought he was the king king. He thought he was it. Honestly, he stopped the round and I had to give him the ring and do a couple of rounds with him. And I just stayed on, and, and one bloke even stopped during the fight, and he said to me, you know you're only punching me gloves? Why don't you try to hit me in the head? And I'm not bragging, but the next bit, when I got going, he threw a punch at me, and I went down under that, and I went bang, just near his stomach, and he come up, whack, and put my hand on his jaw, and I stepped back, and I said, nah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> don't want to do that. And he looked at me, said, don't want to do that, I just want to do it the way I do it, because I didn't want to lose my temper or nothing in there. And this bloke got in there real cocky. I lost my temper. And I grabbed his head after I after I <laughs> across the boxing ring with him, got him in the corner and grabbed his head and just went like that to let him know I'm <laughs> I've got you, mate. With me gloves on and everything. <laughs> and my coach looked at me, he shot himself now. He committed suicide. And I, after I walked down the ring that night, I thought, man, never again. I lost it. God, you separated me from that. You separated me from that. I'm not going back to it, God. And I haven't been back to, to training or boxing since, since then. And that, that's the reason why, because it was bringing up an anger inside of me that I knew I didn't want to have anymore. And if anything was going to... I'd done that for years before I got to that place. And I lost it that night, and I said, that's it, just stop going. Finished, hung the gloves up. I still had the gloves, and then I lost them. Hung them up. <laughs> but I'm just saying this. There was this anger that came out of that, that God showed me. And I knew that I don't want that, God. I don't want to go back to that place. That there was violent, there was just, I just had an anger that I wanted to hurt this bloke. He'd be cocking about me and whatever and whatever, you know. And I had him in the corner <laughs> and I made out, look, mate, I could just whack. I was showing him that I'm going to drive me, put me knee into your face. But I didn't want it. I didn't want that. God gave me a law. God placed the law in my life. It was sinful, God, leading to glory, death for glory, glorifying death, but he put it there in my life. And this is why I couldn't settle. It's the word of God. I can't settle with the word of God if it's, if it's saying contrary to what... It's, 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 it's that, that, that law... Lord, that was there, that I found out that I had an anger issue, that I had real issues, and I had to, I had to learn how to deal with that anger issues and get it out of the way. And it was that law that was still placed there, God, when I got angry that night at boxing, that I thought, no, I never want to go there again, God. I don't want that to come back in. And I walked away and, 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 and left it because of the law. So I'm thinking, how could that be glorifying death in my life, Lord, if it was that law that let me see that what I was doing was wrong? If you can understand what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm not, I'm not an evil bloke. I'm a sovereign. 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So there's the strength of sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing 
that your labor is not yet in vain. Mm. As death, mm. the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Mm. So the sting of the death is sin. So how, how, like it just still didn't, it didn't sit right with me. How could we be glorifying death? How could it be the glory, the glorious death of the law? It didn't sit right with me, God. I need you to open this up and explain to me. I'm just I'm going through some of the uh, these scriptures are in my heart. I don't have to look up the Bible for this. These are inside of me. When God shows me something, bang, this comes up. This scripture comes up. Another one comes up. Another one comes up. And God, I, I just can't understand what you're saying about this, God. I can't understand. It's your word, and I don't argue against your word, God. It's holy and it's precious and it's mighty and it's, it's awesome his word it's so holy how can we argue one man wanted to argue me about it and i wouldn't because of how holy it is god but it's not sitting right in me romans 5 12. this one was the first ever communion i ever done in the aog in church in narrowborough one of the scriptures that I used that day. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because of all sin. <coughs> death has come through sin. You see what I'm, where I'm the picture I'm showing you? Death came through sin. It didn't come through the law. It came through sin. And I'm, 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 I'm thinking to God, what are you saying? for God. Why are you saying this Lord? Death didn't come through the law. It came through sin but we glorify death. So what are we doing? We're glorifying sin. Glory is through sin for our life. When we live our life like I can keep going but I, I, I question God. And then, I, then God changed me. It's not the law, it's the, what the law brought about. The law brought about sin in my life. And we live a life and we glorify death. We, li we live a life, I lived a life before Christ. I just told you that anger that I had. I lived a life just in one anger. In just one area. I had billions probably of things in my life that I had to change. And I've still got a million or two that I have to change. I don't know if it's that many. I don't know if it's a million that I had to change or a million, a million I've got to change. But it's a lot that I've got to change and it was a lot that I had to change. You can understand that? It was a lot. Of, and I've still got it there and I'm still changing the day and I'm, I'm allowing God to come and change me. Why? Because sin leads to death. Sin actually leads to death. We have to understand that. Sin is death. The, the, the sting of death is sin. And we've all got it. And we've all can't help ourselves. But we've got God. We've got Jesus. And we've got the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is living inside of us to convict us of that sin. Not to make us feel guilty. Because guilt, you'll do it again. Conviction, you'll do it again, but you will think about when you're doing it again, and you won't do it because you're just doing it because it was guilt last time. You're doing it this time. Now I know I've been convicted over that. When I do it now, I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong, and you know what happens to that person? If you willfully sin after the knowledge of the truth, therefore there remains no other sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, and you're treading the blood of Jesus underfoot. That's in Hebrews. Mm -hmm. It's in the book of Hebrews. So when you feel guilty, you'll willfully sin again. But in repentance, you will think about it. Even while you're doing it, you'll know it's wrong. That means you've received repentance about it. You've received repentance. And what's that repentance? What's it supposed to do? It's supposed to make you believe in Jesus. These dates must have been Easter in the last couple of years because I've got some 
video clips coming up on Facebook of Jesus copping a flogging. So it must have been Good Friday. And I've been sharing. I share them back when I share them every year that they come up. I share every memory. That's all I share on Facebook is memories. And every now and then I throw something else in. But the flogging he took, the flogging he took, he wants you to get me, not you, he wants me to be convicted of my sins. So as I'm just about to put my hand out and dabble again, I see the man standing there go. And then when I see him pull it back, I see the, 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 the lead go into his ribs and rip back and pull back skin. That's why he wants me to see repentance and not guilt. He wants me to be, to, to be able to believe in him so I can believe what he's done for me. Hey? So I can believe what he's done for me. And he's done a lot for me. He's done a lot for me. He's done a terrible lot for me. Go back to 1 Corinthians. I don't want to go on that too hard. <laughs> I don't want to hurt two people, but it's true. That's what repentance is. This is what Jesus wants us to get through the Holy Spirit to believe on him so we can believe what he's done for us. And that's got to be deep in our heart. That's got to be real. That's got to be deep in our heart. What he's done for us. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 8 now. Yeah. Uh, two, Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, sorry, 3 verse 8. That was me getting lost. I thought it was down here, 3. Uh, 2. <laughs> but it, uh, hang on. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? If the ministry of sin is glorious, how much more the ministry, so how much more that conviction that you get and you being obedient to that conviction, how much more glorious will that be? I just read it. How will the ministry how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? How will it not be? If the ministry of sin leads to death, how will not the ministry of conviction not be more glorious. How will the ministry of this, I'm throwing this in there, but the Spirit come to give us conviction. So how will the ministry of conviction be no more glorious, be a lot more glorious than the convict, than, than, the, than the guilt <laughs> and just turning away from it because I'm guilty. Verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what we made glorious had been not no for even what was made glorious had no glory in the, this respect because of the glory that excels. The law was glorious. The law was great. The reason why it was great was because it was a plan of God for God to allow me today to see that I'm a sinner. He breathed into me. He breathed into Adam, sorry. He breathed into Adam the living life. And that there, I believe, was his spirit. He was breathing in there. But Adam sinned and fell. And then that sin, that, that spirit needed to be awoken. It needed to be woken up. And Adam lived his he lived for 900 and something years. Wow. Imagine that. He was way up here with God and he fell. And God said, sorry, Adam, I'm going to give you 918 years to remember what you've done. And he lived 900, I'm just guessing 18, but I was I know it was over 900 years. He lived knowing that I was at this place with God. And look where I'm at today. Look where we're at today. Today, Eve. Look where we're at today. We were up here with God. We had everything. But look where we're at today. Because of what we've done. Because of what we've done. But God breathed into his spirit and that come down. 
every man that was born and every woman that was born after still had that spirit inside them. That was the chain that came down. We still have that. That needs to be awakened. God knew that he placed it inside of us because he knew that one day he was going to give this blessing. Oh, I just woke up today thinking I might give him the law. Moses, go up on the mountain. Don't work like that with God. He knows before and after. He knows all about it. He had it in his plan that he was going to give the law to awaken us to realise that we were sinners because he placed himself inside of us so that one day that wind would come and that wind would set us on fire, would, would, it would stir up and it would show us through the law that we were doing stuff wrong so the Spirit could now make us want to not do that. See, the part of plan of God He's an awesome God. He had it all in place. He knew what he was doing. Satan thought he won, and we thought he was only defeated at the cross. But God was playing a game of chess with him and was moving the men around all the way through time until he got to the cross and said, Checkmate. Amen. Checkmate. There's no way out of this one, Satan. Amen. And that's what I believe. If you reject the Holy Spirit, he's going to say, Checkmate. There's no way out of this one. We've got to receive the Holy Spirit. We've got to have the Holy Spirit. He's the one that's going to get us through. Amen. However you want to read it. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more, more in glory. For when even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. What was that going to come? That was God bringing Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then he brought the day of Pentecost. When God said, I'm going to fill your temple. I'm going to fill you with me. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to awaken that little bit that I have in there of me. I'm going to awaken that. And you're once again, you're going to see the law as, as, as evidence of sin. A law as proof that you're a sinner. You're going to see it like that. You're going to have it. And then you're going to either have a little bit of me inside you or you're going to have a flooding. You're going to have an infilling. You're going to have a flooding. You're just going to open up and just let me pour it in and pour it in and pour it in. It does. John 3.34. The Spirit is given without measure. He gives the Holy Spirit without any measure to it. He gives it, he pours it in. Why? Because he wants us to see the law set up and that we are anti-law because we're a law unto ourselves. We do what we want to do. Even in the church we're a law unto ourselves. We do what we want to do. And not what God wants us to do all the time. We always do what we want to do. Oh, God's always put second. Oh, I'm hearing from God. You're not hearing from God because if you were hearing from God, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it in the first place. We're a law unto ourselves in the church. God tolerates it. He gives us his son Jesus. He gives us the Holy Spirit to waken up inside of us for us to get convicted. To get convicted of our sin so that we can what? Believe more in Jesus. It's not about believing in the name. Mate, I've been sitting, I've been I've been asleep in the back of the truck in the park with the tent and looked over on the corner and the boys are over there at 6 o'clock in the morning with the cars or in the jar and the cars not drinking out of there because they don't want to catch each other's germs. They've got, I don't know, jars or jam tins or whatever you want to have there. It's cups, drinking, motors out. And then they wander over to the meeting at 7 o'clock at night and they tell you about Jesus. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. I know Jesus. They're drunk. They've been drinking all day. As anyone can believe in Jesus. Anyone can. It's about having the Holy Spirit and believing in Him His way. Not our way. His way. Because most of us in the church believe in Jesus our way. But He wants us to believe His way. And His way is through conviction. We can only believe in Him through conviction. His way. 
That's when we don't feel guilty over our sin, that we feel convicted and we feel guilty. We'll feel, we'll get down there and cry and forgive me, God. Oh, 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 oh. And then the next day you'll get up and walk out and do it again because you've only done it with guilt. You haven't done it with conviction. You need to do it. We need the Holy Spirit so we do it with conviction. Verse 11. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. The law was passed away. It was gone when Jesus came. Because we're not under the law no more. But we're under grace. We're under God's righteousness. We're under his grace. But grace isn't, grace isn't a reason for us to run out and do what we want to do. Grace is a reason for us to receive conviction of the Holy Spirit. To feel God telling us what to do, and we start being obedient to what God tells us. Instead of making up God, this is what God's saying, and letting everyone think, oh, they hear from God, but they're not hearing from God anyway. They're only doing their own bellies, doing their own desires. God tells us, desire to be prophets. Go and prophesy, do that, do that. But make sure you prophesy the truth. Make sure you prophesy the truth. He desires that all of us would be prophets. It says it in Corinthians. He wants all of us. We all desire the gifts. Desire them. Everyone's got the ability to be able to prophesy. Start prophesying. You've got that. But prophesy what God's saying. Don't prophesy what you're saying. Prophesy the truth. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that it sells. For what if for for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So the law is gone for us. The law's still set up there for people. You know why the law's still set up for people? 